Oh my, Freepio gasped. General Carusian, I have... Quiet, Freepio, Lando warded, peering carefully around the edge of the window at the minor commotion going on across the square. Did you see what happened, Aves? Crouched down beneath the window sill, Aves shook his head. Looked like Skywalker and his droid both fell over, he said. Couldn't tell for sure. Too many stormtroopers in the way. General Calrissian? Quiet, Freebio. Lando watched tensely as two stormtroopers pulled Luke to his feet, then righted R2. Looks like they're okay. Yeah. Aves reached down to the floor beside him, picked up the small small transmitter. Here we go. Let's hope everyone's ready. And that chin and the others aren't still carrying their blasters, Lando uttered under his breath. Aves snorted. They aren't. Don't worry. Stormtroopers are always confiscating other people's weapons. Lando nodded, adjusting his grip on his blaster, wishing they could get this over with. Across the way, the Imperials seemed to have gotten themselves sorted out and were starting to move again. As soon as they were all inside the square, away from any possible cover, General Carrizian, I must speak to you, Freepio insisted. I have a message from Master Luke. Lando blinked at him. From Luke? But even as he said it, he suddenly remembered the electronic wail from Artu just after he'd fallen over. Could that have been... What is it? Master Luke wants you to hold off the attack, Freepio said, obviously relieved that someone was finally listening to him. He says you ought to wait until the stormtroopers are at the arch before firing. Aves twisted around. What? That's crazy. They outnumber us three to one. We give them any chance at all to at cover and they'll cut us to pieces. Lando looked out the window, grinding his teeth together. Aves was right. He knew enough of ground tactics to realise that. But on the other hand, they're awfully spread out out there, he said. Cover or no cover, they're going to be hard to take out, especially if those speeder bikes on their perimeter. Aves shook his head. It's crazy, he repeated. I'm not going to risk my people that way. Luke knows what he's doing, Lando insisted. He's a Jedi. He's not a Jedi now, Aves snorted. Didn't Card explain about the Asalamiri? Whether he has Jedi powers or not, he's still a Jedi, Lando insisted. His blaster, he realized suddenly, was pointed at Aves, but that was okay, because Aves' blaster was pointed at him, too. Anyway, his life is more on the line here than any of yours. You can always abort and pull back. Oh, sure, Ave snorted, throwing a glance out the window. The Imperials are nearing the middle of the square now, Lando saw. The stormtroopers looking wary and alert as anything. Except that if we leave any of them alive, they'll seal up the city. What about that chariot up there? What about it? Lando countered. I still haven't heard how you're planning to take it out. Well, we sure as places don't want it on the ground, Aves retorted. And that's what'll happen if we let the stormtroopers get to the arch. The chariot will put down right across the front of it, right between us and them. That plus the arch itself will give them all the cover they need to sit back and take us out at their leisure. He shook his head and shifted his grip on the transmitter. Anyway, it's too late to clue in on the others onto any plan changes. You don't have to clue them in, Lando said, feeling sweat collecting under his collar. Luke was counting on him. No one's supposed to do anything until you trigger the booby-trapped weapons. Aves shook his head again. It's too risky. He turned back to the window, raised the transmitter. And here Lando realized, right here, was where it all came down to the wire. Where you decided who or what it was you trusted. Tactics and abstract logic were people. Lowering his blaster, he gently rested the tip of the muzzle against Aves' neck. We wait, he said quietly. Aves didn't move, but suddenly there was something in the way he crouched there that reminded Lando of a hunting predator. I won't forget this, Calrissian, he said, his voice icy soft. I wouldn't want you to, Lando said. He looked out at the stormtroopers, and I hope that Luke did indeed know what he was doing. The vanguard had already passed the archway, and the major was only a few steps away from it when four of the stormtroopers abruptly blew up. Quite spectacularly, too. The simultaneous flashes of yellow-white fire lit up the landscape to almost painful intensity. The thunderclap of the multiple detonations nearly knocked Luke over. The sound was still ringing in his ears when the blasters opened up behind them. The stormtroopers were good all right. There was no panic that Luke could detect, no sudden freezing in astonishment or indecision. They were moving into combat position almost before the blast of fire had begun. There was already at the archway hugging close to the stone pillars but to return covering fire, the rest moving quickly to join them. Above the sound of the blasters, he could hear the increased whine of the speeder bikes kicking into high speed. Overhead, he caught just a glimpse of the chariot assault vehicle swiveling around to face the unseen attackers. And then an armoured hand caught him under each armpit, and suddenly he was being hauled toward the archway. A few seconds later, he was dumped unceremoniously in the narrow gap between the two pillars supporting the north side of the arch. Mara was already crouched there. A second later, two more stormtroopers tossed Han in to join them. Four of the Imperials moved into position over them, using the pillars for cover as they began returning fire. 
Struggling to his knees, Luke leaned out for a look. Out in the fire zone, looking small and helpless amid the deadly horizontal hail of blaster fire, R2 was rolling toward them as fast as his little wheels could, would carry him. I think we're in trouble, Han muttered in his ear. Not to mention Lando and the others. It's not over yet, Luke told him tightly. Just too close. How are you at causing distractions? Terrific, Han said, and to Luke's surprise, he brought his hands out from behind his back, the chain and manacles he'd been wearing hanging loose from his left wrist. Trick cuffs, he granted, pulling a concealed strip of metal from the inside of the open cuff and probing at Luke's restraints. I hope this thing... Ah! The pressure on Luke's wrist was suddenly gone. The cuffs opened and dropped to the ground. You ready for your distraction? Han asked, taking the loose end of his chain in his free hand. Hang on a minute, Luke told him, looking up. Most of the speeder bikes had taken refuge under the arch, looking like some strange species of giant birds hiding from a storm as they hovered close to the stone, their laser cannon spitting toward the surrounding houses. In front of them and just below their line of fire, the chariot had swiveled parallel to the arch and was coming down. Once it was on the ground, a hand gripped Luke's arm, fingernails digging hard into the skin. Whatever you're going to do, do it, Mara hissed viciously. If the chariot gets down, you'll never get them out from cover. I know, Luke nodded. I'm counting on it. The chariot settled smoothly to the ground, exactly in front of the arch, blocking the last of the attacker's firing vectors. Crashed at the window, Ave swore violently. Well, there's your Jedi for you, he bit out. You got any other great ideas, Calrissian? Lando swallowed hard. We've just got to give him. He never finished the sentence. From the arch, a blaster bolt glanced off the window frame, and suddenly Lando's upper arm flashed with pain. The shock sent him stumbling backward just as a second shot blew apart that whole section of the frame, driving wooden splinters and chunks of masonry like shrapnel across his chest and arm. He hit the floor, landing hard enough to see stars. Blinking, gritting his teeth against the pain, he looked up to find Aves leaning over him. Lando looked up into the other's face. I won't forget this, Aves had said no more than three minutes ago, and from the look on his face, he wasn't anticipating any need to hold that memory for much longer. He'll come through, Lando whispered through the pain. He will. But he could tell that Aves wasn't listening, and, down deep, Lando couldn't blame him. Lando Calrissian, the professional gambler, had gambled one last time, and he'd lost. And the debt from that gamble, the last in a long line of such debts, had come due. A chariot settled smoothly to the ground directly in front of the arch, and Luke got his feet under him. This was it. All right, Han, he muttered. Go. Han nodded and surged to his feet, coming up right in the middle of the four stormtroopers standing over them. With a bellow, he swung his former shackles, full across the faceplate of the nearest guard, then threw the loop chain around the neck of the next and pulled backwards, away from the pillars. The other two reacted instantly, leaping after him and taking the whole group down in the tangle. And for the next few seconds, Luke was free. He stood up and leaned out to look around the pillar. Artu was still in the middle of no man's land, hurrying to reach cover before he could be hit by a stray shot. He wobbled plaintively as he saw Luke. Artu, now! Luke shouted, holding out his hand and glancing across toward the southern end of the archway. Between the stone pillars and the grounded chariot, the stormtroopers were indeed solidly entrenched. If this didn't work, Han was right. Lando and everyone else out there was, were dead. Gritting his teeth, hoping fervently that his counterattack wasn't already too late, he turned back to R2. Just as, with a flicker of silver metal and perfect accuracy, his lightsaber dropped neatly into his outstretched hand. Beside him, the guards had subdued Han's crazy attack and were getting back to their feet, leaving Han on his knees between them. Luke took them all in a single sweep, the blazing green lightsaber blade slicing through the glistening stormtrooper armor, with hardly a tug to mark its passing. Get behind me, he snapped to Han and Mara, stepping back to the gap between the two northern pillars and focusing on the massive Imperial standing and crouching between him and the southern pillars. They were suddenly aware that they had an unexpected threat on their flank, and a few were already starting to bring their blasters to bear on him. With the force to guide his hand, he could have held out against them indefinitely, blocking their blaster shots with the lightsaber. Mara had been right, though. The Acela Miri effect did indeed extend this far outside the forest, and the force was still silent. But then he'd never had any intention of fighting the stormtroopers anyway. Turning his back on the blasters tracking toward him, he slashed the lightsaber across and upward, neatly slicing one of the stone pillars in half. There was a loud crack as suddenly released tension sent a shiver through the structure. Another stroke cut through the second pillar, and the noise of the battle was abruptly drowned out by the awful grinding of stone on stone as the two fractured pillars began sliding apart. Luke swung back around, peripherally aware of Han and Mara scrambling out from under the arch to safety behind him. 
The stormtroopers' expressions were hidden behind their masks, but the look of sudden horror on the mage's face said it all for them. Overhead, the mass of the arch creaked warningly. Setting his teeth, Luke locked a lightsaber on and hurled it across the gap toward the pillars there. He cut through one of them and nicked the other, and with a roar, the whole thing came crashing down. Luke, standing at the edge, barely got out from under it in time. The stormtroopers crouched in the center, didn't. Card walked around the massive stone to where the crumpled nose of the chariot assault vehicle poked out, a sense of slightly stunned disbelief colouring his vision. One man, he murmured. Well, we helped some, Aves reminded him, but the sarcasm of the words faded beneath the grudging respect clearly there behind it. And without the force, too, Card said. He sensed Aves struck uncomfortably. That's what Mara said, though of course Skywalker might have lied to her about it. Unlikely. A motion at the edge of the square caught his eye and Card looked over to see Solo and Skywalker helping a distinctly shaky-looking Lando Calrissian to one of the airspeeders parked around the perimeter. Took a shot, did he? Aves grunted. Came close to taking one of mine, too, he said. I thought he'd betrayed us. Figured I'd make sure he didn't walk away from it. In retrospect, it's just as well you didn't. Card looked up, searching the skies, wondering how long it would take the Imperials to respond to what had happened here today. Aves looked up, too. We might still be able to hunt down the other two chariots before they get a chance to report, he suggested. I don't think the headquarters people got any messages away before we took them out. <clears throat> Card shook his head, feeling a deep surge of sadness rising through the sense of urgency within him. Not until now had he truly realized just how much he'd come to love this place. His base, the forest, the planet Merka itself. Now, when there was no choice but to abandon it. No, he told Aves. There's no way to cover up our part in what happened here. Not from a man like Thrawn. You're probably right, Aves said, his voice taking on a sense of urgency of its own. He understood the implications of that, all right. You want me to head back and start the evacuation? Yes, and take Mara with you. Make sure she keeps busy, somewhere away from the Millennium Falcon and Skywalker's X-Wing. He felt Aves' eyes on him, but if the other wondered, he kept his wonderings to himself. Right, see you later. He hurried away. The airspeeder with Calrissian aboard was lifting off now, heading back to where the Falcon was being prepped for flight. Solo and Skywalker were heading over toward a second airspeeder. With just a moment's hesitation, Card went over to intercept them. They reached the craft at the same time, and for a moment eyed each other across its bow. Card, Solo said at last. I owe you one. Card nodded. Are you still going to get the everway out of impoundment for me? I said I would, Solo told him. Where do you want it delivered? Just leave it on Abrogado. Someone will pick it up. He turned his attention to Skywalker. An interesting little trick, he commented, tilting his head back toward the massive rubble. Unorthodox, to say the least. Skywalker shrugged. It worked, he said simply. Bad it did, Card agreed, likely saving several of my people's lives in the bargain. Skywalker looked at him straight back in the eye. Does that mean you've made your decision? Card gave him a slight smile. I don't really see as I have much choice anymore. He looked back at Solo. I presume you'll be leaving immediately? As soon as we can get Luke's X-Wing rigged for towing, Solo nodded. Lando's doing okay, but he's going to need more specialized medical attention than the Falcon can handle. It could have been worse, Card said. Solo gave him a knowing look. A lot worse, he agreed, his voice hard. So could all of it, Card reminded him, putting an edge into his own voice. He could, after all, just as easily have turned the three of them over to the Imperials in the first place. And Solo knew it. Yeah, he conceded. Well, so long. Card watched as they got into the airspeeder. One other thing, he said as they strapped in. Obviously we're going to have to pull out of here before the Imperials figure out what's happened. That means a lot of lifting capacity if we're going to do it quickly. You wouldn't happen to have any surplus cargo or stripped down military ships lying around I could have, would you? Solo gave him a strange look. We don't have enough cargo capacity for the New Republic's normal business, he said. I think I might have mentioned that to you. Well then, alone perhaps, Card persisted. A stripped down Mon Calamari Star Cruiser would do nicely. I'm sure it would, Solo returned with more than a hint of sarcasm. I'll see what I can do. The canopy dropped down, dropped smoothly down over them and sealed in place. Card stepped back and with a whine of repulsor lifts, the airspeeder rose into the sky, orienting itself as shot off toward the forest. Card watched it go, wondering if that last suggestion had been too little too late, but perhaps not. Solo was the type to hold debts of honor sacred, something he'd probably picked up from his Wookiee friend somewhere along the line. If he could find a spare star cruiser, he'd likely send it along. And once here, it would be easy to steal from whatever handler Solo sent it with. Perhaps such a gift would help assuage Grand Admiral Thrawn's inevitable anger over what had happened here today. But then perhaps it wouldn't. Card looked back at the ruins of the collapsed arch, a shiver running through him. No, a warship wasn't going to help. 
Not on this. Fawn had lost too much here to simply shrug it off as the fortunes of war. He would be back, and he would be coming for blood. And for perhaps the first time in his life, Cart felt the unpleasant stirrings of genuine fear. In the distance, the airspeeder disappeared over the forest canopy. Card turned and gave Hilliard City one final, lingering look. One way or the other, he knew he would never see it again. Luke Otlando settled into one of the Falcon's bunks, while Han and a couple of Card's men busied themselves outside getting a tow cable attached to the X-Wing. The Falcon's medical package was fairly primitive, but it was up to the task of cleaning and bandaging a blaster burn. A complete healing job would have to wait until they could get him to a to tank, but for the moment he seemed comfortable enough. Leaving R2 and Freepio to watch over him, despite his protestations that he didn't need watching over and, furthermore, had had enough of Freepio, Luke returned to the cockpit just as the ship lifted off. Any problems with the tow cable? he asked, sliding into the co-pilot seat. Not so far, Han said, leaning forward and looking all around them as the Falcon cleared the trees. The extra weight's not bothering us anyway. We should be alright. Good. You expecting company? You never know, Han said, giving this guy one last look before settling back into his seat and gunning the repulsor lifts. Card said there were still a couple of chariots and a few speeder bikes unaccounted for. One of them might have figured that a last-ditch suicide run was better than having to go back to the Grand Admiral and report. Luke stared at him. Grand Admiral? he asked carefully. Han's lip twisted. Yeah, that's who seems to be running the show now for the Empire. A cold chill ran up Luke's back. I thought we'd accounted for all the Grand Admirals. Me too. We must have missed one. And abruptly, right in the middle of Han's last word, Luke felt a surge of awareness and strength fill him, as if he were waking up from a deep sleep or stepping from a dark room into the light or suddenly understanding the universe again. The Force was again with him. He took a deep breath, eyes flicking across the control board for the altimeter. Just over 12 kilometers. Card had been right. Those you Salamiri did, indeed, reinforce one another. I don't suppose you got a name, he murmured. Card wouldn't give it to me, Han said, throwing a curious frown in Luke's direction. Maybe we can bargain the use of that star cruiser he wants for it. You okay? I'm fine, Luke assured him. I just... It's like being able to see again after having been blind. Han snorted under his breath. Yeah, I know how that is, he said wryly. I guess you would, Luke looked at him. I didn't get a chance to say this earlier, but thanks for coming after me. Han waved it away. No charge. And I didn't get a chance to say it earlier, he glanced at Luke again, but you look like something the Proom dragged in. A wonderful disguise, Luke told him, touching his face gingerly. Mara assumes, assures me it'll wear off in a few more hours. Yeah, Mara, Han said. You and she seem to be hitting it off pretty well there. Luke grimaced. Don't count on it, he said. Matter of having a common enemy, that's all. First the forest, then the Imperials. He could sense Han casting around for a way to ask the next question, decided to save him the trouble. She wants to kill me, he told the other. Any idea why? Luke opened his mouth, and to his own surprise, closed it again. There wasn't any particular reason not to tell Han what he knew about Mara's past, certainly no reason he could think of, and yet somehow he felt a strangely compelling reluctance to do so. It's something personal, he said at last. Han threw him an odd look. Something personal? How personal can a death mark get? It's not a death mark, Luke insisted. It's something, well, personal. Han gazed at him a moment longer, then turned back to his piloting. Oh, he said. The Falcon had cleared the atmosphere now and was gunning for deep space. From this high up, Luke decided, the forest looked rather pleasant. You know, I never did find out what this pla what planet this was, he commented. It's called Mirka, Han told him. And I just found out this morning. I think Card must have already decided to abandon the place, even before the battle. He had real tight security around it when Lando and I first got here. A few minutes later, a light flashed on the control board. The Falcon was far enough out of Merka's gravity well for the hyperdrive to function. Good, Han nodded at it. The courses are already programmed in. Let's get out of here. He wrapped his hand around the central levers and pulled, and with a burst of star lines, they were off. Where are we going? Luke asked as the star lines faded into the familiar mottled sky. Coruscant? A little side trip first, Han said. I want to swing by the Sluisvan shipyards, see if we can get Lando and your X-Wing fixed up. Luke threw him a sideways glance. And maybe find a star cruiser to borrow for card? Maybe, Han said, a little defensively. I mean, Akbar's got a bunch of stripped-down warships ferrying stuff to the Slewis sector already. No reason why we can't borrow one of them for a couple of days. For a couple of days, is there? Probably not. Luke conceded with a sigh. 
suddenly it felt really good to just sit back and do nothing. I suppose Coruscant can do without us for a few more days. I hope so, Han said, his voice abruptly grim. But something's about to happen back there, if it hasn't happened already. And his sense was as grim as his words. Maybe we shouldn't bother with Slewis Vaughn then, Luke suggested, feeling a sympathetic shiver. Lando's hurting, but he's not in any danger. Han shook his head. No, I want to get him taken care of. And you, buddy, need some downtime too, he added, glancing at Luke. I just wanted you to know that when we hit Coruscant, we're going to hit it running. So enjoy Slewis Vaughn while you can. It will probably be the last peace and quiet you'll get for a while. In the blackness of deep space, three thousandths of a light year out from the Sluisvan shipyards, the task force assembled for battle. The Judicator has just reported in, Captain, the communications officer told Peleon. They confirm battle ready and request order update. Inform Captain Brandi that there have been no changes, Peleon told him, standing at the starboard viewport and gazing out at the shadowy shapes gathered around the Chimera, all but the closest identifiable, only by the distinctive patterns of their running lights. It was an impressive task force, one worthy of the old days. Five Imperial Star Destroyers, twelve Strike-class cruisers, twenty-two of the old Carrick-class light cruisers, and thirty full squadrons of TIE fighters standing ready in their hangar bays. Riding there in the middle of all that awesome firepower, like someone's twisted idea of a joke, sat the battered old A-class bulk freighter. The key to this whole operation. Status, Captain? Thrawn's voice came quietly from behind him. Plan turned to face the Grand Admiral. All ships are online, sir, he reported. The Freeder's cloaking shield has been checked and pr out and primed. All TIE fighters are prepped and manned. I think we're ready. Thrawn nodded, his glowing eyes sweeping the field of running lights around them. Excellent, he murmured. What word from Mirka? The question threw Palaon off stride. He hadn't thought about Mirka for days. I don't know, Admiral, he confessed, looking over Thrawn's shoulder at the communications officer. Lieutenant, the last report from the Mirka landing force... The other was already calling up the record. It was a routine report, sir, he said. Time log. Fourteen hours, ten minutes ago. Thrawn turned to face him. Fourteen hours, he repeated, his voice suddenly very quiet and very deadly. I left orders for them to report every twelve. Yes, Admiral, the comm man said, starting to look a little nervous. I have that order logged right here on their file. They must have... He trailed off, looking helplessly at Palaon. They must have forgotten to report in, was Palaon's first hopeful reaction but it died stillborn. Stormtroopers didn't forget such things. Ever. Perhaps they're having trouble with their transmitter, he suggested hesitantly. For a handful of heartbeats, Thrawn just stood there, silent. No, he said at last. They've been taken. Skywalker was indeed there. Plown hesitated, shook his head. I can't believe that, sir, he said. Skywalker couldn't have taken all of them. Not with all those Yusalamiri blocking his Jedi power. Thrawn turned those glittering eyes back to Peleon. I agree, he said coldly. Obviously he had help. Pleon forced himself to meet that gaze. Card? Who else was there? Thrawn countered, so much for his protestations of neutrality. Pleon glanced at the status board. Perhaps we should send someone to investigate. We could probably spare a strike cruiser, maybe even the Stormhawk. Thrawn took a deep breath, let it out slowly. No, he said, his voice steady and controlled again. The Sluisvan operation is our primary concern at the moment and battles have been lost before on the presence or absence of a single ship. Card and his betrayal will keep for later. He turned back to, his communi to the communications officer. Signal the Freeta, he ordered. Have them activate the cloaking shield. Yes, sir. Pleon turned back to the viewport. The Freeta, bathed in the Chimera's lights, just sat there looking innocent. Cloaking shield on, Admiral, the comm man reported. Thrawn nodded. Order them to proceed. Yes, sir. Moving rather sluggishly, the Freedom maneuvered past the Chimera, oriented itself toward the distant sun of the Sluisvan system, and with a flicker of pseudo-velocity jumped to light speed. Time mark? Thrawn ordered. Time marked. One of the deck officers acknowledged. Thrawn looked at Peleon. Is my flagship ready, Captain? He asked the formal question. The Chimera is fully your command, Admiral. Peleon gave the formal answer. Good. We followed the Freedom in exactly six hours, twenty minutes. I want a final check from all ships and I want you to remind them one last time that our task is only to engage and pin down the system's defences. There are to be no special heroics or risks taken. Make that clearly understood, Captain. We're here to gain ships, not lose them. Yes, sir. Pleon started toward his command station. And Captain? Yes, Admiral? There was a tight smile on Thrawn's face. Remind them too, he added softly, that our final victory over the Rebellion begins here.
Captain Affion of the escort frigate Larkes shook his head with thinly disguised contempt, glaring at Wedge from the depths of his pilot seat. You X-wing hot shots, he growled. You've really got it made. You know that? Wedge shrugged, trying hard not to take offence. It wasn't easy, but then he'd had lots of practice in the past few days. Affion had started out from Coruscant with a planetary mass chip on his shoulder, and had been nursing it the whole way. And looking out of the viewpoint of the confused mass of ships crowding the Sluis Van orbit dock area, it wasn't hard to figure out why. Yeah, well, we're stuck out here too, he reminded the captain. The other snorted. Yeah, big sacrifice. You lounge around my ship like overpriced trampers for a couple of days, then flit around for two hours while I try to dodge bulk freighters and get this thing into a docking station designed for scavenger pickers. Then you pull your snubbies back inside and go back to lounging again. Doesn't exactly qualify as earning your pay in my book. Wedge clamped his tea firmly around his tongue and stirred his tea a little harder. It was considered bad form to mouth back at senior officers. After all, even senior officers who'd long since passed their prime. For probably the first time since he had been given command of Rogue Squadron, he regretted having passed up all the rest of the promotions he'd been offered. A higher rank would at least have entitled him to snarl back a little. Lifting his cup for a cautious sip, he gazed out the viewport at the scene around them. No, he amended. He wasn't sorry at all that he'd stayed with his X-Wing. If he hadn't, he'd probably be in exactly the same position as Affion was right now, trying to run a 920 crew ship with just 15 men, hauling cargo in a ship meant for war. And like as not, having to put up with hotshot X-Wing pilots who sat around his bridge drinking tea and claiming of perfect justification that they were doing exactly what they'd been ordered to do. He had a smile behind his mug. Yes, in Affion's place, he'd probably be ready to spit bulkhead shavings too. Maybe he ought to go ahead and let the other drag him into an argument. In fact, let him drain off some of that excess nervous energy of his. Eventually, within the hour, even if Slewis Control's latest departure estimate was anywhere close, it would finally be the Larkus's turn to get out of here and head for Bafash. It would be nice when that time came for Affion to be calm enough to handle the ship. Taking another sip of his tea, Wedge looked out the viewport. A couple of refitted passenger liners were making their own break for freedom now, he saw, accompanied by four Corellian corvettes. Beyond them, just visible in the faint light of the space lane marker bayous, was what looked like one of the slightly ovoid transports he used to escort during the height of the war, with a pair of B-wings following. And off to the side, moving parallel to their departure vector, an A-class bulk freighter was coming into the docking pattern, without any escort at all. Wedge watched it creep toward them, his smile fading as old combat sensors began to tingle. Swiveling around in his seat, he reached over to the console beside him and punched for a scan to scan. It looked innocent enough, an older freighter, probably a knockoff of the original Corellian Action 4 design, with the kind of exterior that came from either a lifetime of honest work or also a short and spectacularly unsuccessful career of piracy. His cargo bay registered a completely empty, and there were no weapons emplacements that the Larkus' sensors could pick up. A totally empty freighter. How long had it been, he wondered uneasily, since he'd run across a totally empty freighter. Trouble? Wedge focused on the captain in mild surprise. The other's frustrated anger of a minute ago was gone, replaced by something calm, alert, and battle-ready. Perhaps the thought strayed f through Wedge's mind. Affion wasn't past his prime after all. That incoming freighter, he told the other, setting his cup down on the edge of the console and keying for a comm channel. There's something about it that doesn't feel right. Captain peered out the viewport, then at the sensor scan data Wedge had pulled up. I don't see anything, he said. Me either, Wedge had to admit. There's just something. Blast. What? Control won't let me in, Wedge told him as he keyed off. Too much traffic on the circuits already, they say. Allow me, Affion turned to his own console. The freighter was shifting course now, the kind of slow and careful maneuver that usually indicated the full load. But the cargo bay was still registering empty. There we go. Affion said, glancing at Wedge of grim satisfaction. I've got to tap into their records computer. Little trick you never learned flitting around in an X-Wing. Let's see now. Frida Martisestu, out of Nelak Kram. They were jumped by pirates, got their main drive damaged in the fight, and had to dump their cargo to get away. They're hoping to get some repair work done. Slewis Controls basically told them to get in line. I thought all this relief shipping had more or less taken over the whole place, Wedge frowned. Affion shrugged. Theoretically, in practice, well, the Sluisi are easy enough to talk into bending that kind of rule. You just have to know how to phrase the request. Reluctantly, Wedge nodded. It did all seem reasonable enough, he supposed, and a damaged empty ship would probably handle something like an intact full one. 
and the Frida was empty, the lack of his senses said so, but the tinkles refused to go away. Abruptly, he dug his comling from his belt. Rogue Squadron, this is Rogue Leader, he called. Everyone to your ships. He got acknowledgements, looked up to find Affion's eye steady on him. You still think there's trouble? The other asked quietly. Wedge grimaced, throwing one last look out the viewport at, that, at the Frida. Probably not, but it won't hurt to be ready. Anyway, I can't have my pilot sitting around drinking tea all day. He turned and left the bridge at a quick jog. The other eleven members of Rogue Squadron were in their X-Wings by the time he reached the Larkus' docking bay. Three minutes later, they launched. If Rita hadn't made much headway, Wedge saw as they swung up over the Larkus' hull and pulled together into a loose patrol formation. Oddly enough, though, it had moved a considerable distance laterally, drifting away from the Larkus and toward a pair of Calamari's dark cruisers orbiting together a few kilometres away. Spread out formation, Wedge ordered his pilots, shifting to an asymptotic asymptotic approach course. Let's swing by and take a nice, casual little look. The others acknowledged. Wedge glanced down at his nav scope, made a minor adjustment to his speed, looked back up again, and in the space of a single heartbeat, the whole thing went straight to hell. The Frida blew up, all at once, without any warning from sensors, without any hint from previous visual observation, it just came apart. Reflexively, Wedge jabbed for his comm control. Emergency, he barked. Ship explosion near orbit dock V-475. Send rescue team. For an instant, as chunks of the cargo blade flew outward, he could see into the emptiness there. But even as his eyes and brain registered the odd fact that he could see into the disintegrating cargo bay, but not beyond it, the bay was suddenly no longer empty. One of the X-wing pilots gasped. A tight-packed mass of something was in there, totally filling the space where the Larkas' senses had read nothing. A mass that was even now exploding outward like a hornet's nest behind the pieces of the bay. A mess that in seconds had resolved itself into a boiling wave of front of TIE fighters. Pull up! Wedge snapped to his squadron, leading his X-Wing into a tight turn to get out of the path of that deadly surge. Come around and reform! S-foils in attack position! And as they swung around in response, he knew with a sinking feeling that Captain Affion had been wrong. Rogue Squadron was indeed going to earn its pay today. The battle for Slewis Vine had begun. They'd cleared the outer system defense network and the bureaucratic overload that passed for control at Slewis Farm these days, and Han was just getting a bearing on the slot they'd given him when the emergency call came through. Luke, he shouted back down the cockpit corridor, got a ship explosion. I'm going to go check it out. He glanced at the orbit dock map to locate V-475, gave the ship a fractional turn to put them on the right vector, and jerked in his seat as a laser bolt slapped the Falcon hard from behind. He had them gunning into a full forward evasive maneuver before the second shot went sizzling past the cockpit. Over the roar of the engines he heard Luke's startled sounding yelp, and as the third bolt went past he finally had a chance to check the after sensors to see just what was going on. He almost wished he hadn't. Directly behind them, batteries already engaging one of the Slewis found perimeter battle stations, was an Imperial Star Destroyer. He swore under his breath and kicked the engines a little harder. Beside him, Luke clawed his way forward against the not-quite-compensated acceleration into the co-pilot seat. "'What's going on?' he asked. "'We just walked into an Imperial attack,' Han growled, eyes flying over the readouts. "'Got a Star Destroyer behind us. There's another one over to starboard. Looks like some other ships with them.' "'I've got the system bottled up,' Luke said, his voice glacially calm. "'A far cry,' Han fought, from the panicky kid he pulled off Tatooine out from under Star Destroyer fire all those years back. I make five star destroyers and something over twenty ship more and something over twenty smaller ships. Han grunted. At least we know why they hit Fash and the others. Wanted to pull enough ships here to make an attack worth their while. The words were barely out of his mouth when the emergency comm channel suddenly came to life again. Emergency! Imperial TIE fighters in orbit dock area. All ships to battle stations. Luke started. That sounded like Wedge, he said, punching for transmission. Wedge, that you? Luke? The other came back. We got trouble here. At least 40 TIE fighters and 50 truncated, cone-shaped things I've never seen before. He broke off a screech from the X-Wings Everick rudder came faintly over the speaker. I hope you've brought a couple wings of fighters with you, he said. We're going to be a little pressed here. Luke glanced at Han. Afraid it's just Han and me and the Falcon, but we're on our way. Make it fast. Luke heed off the speaker. Is there any way to get me into my X-Wing? He asked. Not fast enough, Han shook his head. We're going to have to drop it here and go in alone. Luke nodded, getting out of his seat. I'd better make sure Lando and the droids are strapped in and then get the, into the gun well. Take the top one, Han called after him. The upper deflector shields are running stronger at the moment and Luke would have more protection there. If there was any protection to be had from 40 TIE fighters and 50 truncated flying cones. For a moment he frowned as a strange thought suddenly struck him. But no, they couldn't possibly be Lando's missing mole miners. 
Even a Grand Admiral wouldn't be crazy enough to try to use something like that in battle. Boosting power to the forward deflectors, he took a deep breath and headed in. All ships commence attack, Palaon called. Full engagement, maintain position and status. He got confirmations, turned to Thrawn. All ships report engaged, sir, he said. But the Grand Admiral didn't seem to hear him. He just stood there at the viewport, gazing outward at the New Republic ship scrambling to meet them, his hands gripped tightly behind his back. Admiral? Palaon asked cautiously. That was them, Captain, Thrawn said, his voice unreadable. That ship straight ahead. That was the Millennium Falcon, and it was towing an X-Wing starfighter behind it. Palaon frowned past the other. The glow of a drive was indeed barely visible past the flashing laser bolts of the battle, already pretty well out of combat range and trying hard to be even more so. But as the design of the craft, much less its identity... Yes, sir, he said, keeping his tone neutral. Cloak leader reports a successful breakout and that the command section of the Freeter is making its escape to the periphery. They're encountering some resistance from escort vehicles and a squadron of X-Wings, but the general response has so far been weak and diffuse. Front took a deep breath, turned away from the viewport. That will change, he told Palaon, back in control again. Remind him not to push his envelope too far, or to waste excessive time in choosing his targets. Also that the space trooper mole miners should concentrate on calamari star cruisers. They're likely to have the largest number of defenders aboard. The red eyes glittered, and informed him that the Millennium Falcon is on its way in. Yes, sir, Pleon said. He glanced up the viewport again, of a distant fleeing ship, towing an X-Wing. You don't think... Skywalker? Thrawn's face hardened. We'll know soon, he said quietly. And if so, Talon Card will have a great deal to answer for. A great deal. Watch at Rogue Five. Wedge warned as a flash of laser fire from somewhere behind him shot past and nicked the wing of one of the X-Wings ahead. We've picked up a tail. I noticed. The other came back. Pincer, on my mark. Wedge confirmed as a second bolt shot past him. Directly ahead, a Calamari Star Cruiser was pulling sluggishly away, trying to get out of the battle zone. Perfect cover for this kind of manoeuvre. Together, he and Rogue Five dived underneath it. Now, leaning hard on his etheric rudder, he peeled off hard to the right. Rogue Five did the same thing to the left. The pursuing TIE fighters hesitated between his diverging targets a split second too long, and even as he swung around to follow, Wedge, Rogue Five, blew him out of the sky. Nice shooting, Wedge said, giving the area a quick scan. The TIE fighters still seemed to be everywhere, but for the moment at least, none of them was close enough to give them any trouble. Five noticed it that too. We seem to be out of it, Rogue Leader, he commented. Easy enough to fix, Wedge told him. His momentum was taking him farther under the star cruise of it used for cover. Curving up and around it, he started to spiral back toward the main battle area. He was just swinging up along the star cruiser's side when he noticed the small cone-shaped thing nestled up against the larger ship's hull. He craned his neck for a better look as he shot past. It was one of the little craft that had come out of the TIE fighters, all right, sitting pressed again up against the star cruiser's bridge blister as if it were welded in place. There was a battle going on nearby, a battle in which his people were fighting and very possibly dying, but something told Wedge that this was important. Hang on a minute, he told Five. I want to check this out. His momentum had already taken him to the star cruiser's bow. He curved around in front of the ship, leaning back into a spiral again. And suddenly his canopy lit up with laser fire, and his X-wing jolted like a startled animal beneath him. The star cruiser had fired on him. In his ear, he heard Five shout something. Stay back, Wedge snapped, fighting against a sudden drop in power and giving his scopes a quick scan. I'm hit, but not bad. They fired on you. Yeah, I know, Wedge said, trying to maintain some kind of evasive maneuvering with what little control he had. Fortunately, the systems were starting to come back online as his R2 unit did some fast rerouting. Even more fortunately, the Star Cruiser didn't seem inclined to shoot at him again. But why had it fired in the first place? Unless... His own R2 was too busy with rerouting chores to handle anything else at the moment. Rogue 5, I need a fast sensor scan, he called. Where are the rest of those cone things? Hang on, I'll check, the other replied. Scope shows. I don't find more than about 15 of them. Nearest one's 10 kilometers away, bearing 118 Mark 4. 118 Mark 4. Wedge felt something hard to settle into his stomach. 15 out of the 50 that had been in that freedom of the TIE fighters. So where are the rest of them gone? Let's go take a look, he said, turning an intercept vector. The cone thing was heading toward another escort frigate like the Larkus, he saw, with four TIE fighters running interference for it. Not that there was much potential for interference. If the frigate was manned anywhere near as fast as the Larkus, it would have precious little chance of fighting back. Let's see if we can take them before they notice us, he told Five as they closed the distance. Abruptly, all four TIE fighters peeled off and came around. So much for surprise. Take the two on the right, Rogue Five. I'll take the others. Copy. 
Wade waited until the last second before firing on the first of his targets, swinging around instantly to avoid collision with the other. It swept past beneath him, his X-wing shuddering as it took another hit. He leaned hard into the turn, catching a glimpse of the TIE fighter dropping into a pursuit slot as he did so, and suddenly something shot past him, spinning laser fire and twisting back and around in some kind of insane variant on a drunkard's walk evasive maneuver. The TIE fighter caught a direct hit and blew into a spectacular cloud of fiery gas. Wedge finished his turn just as Rogue Five's second target fighter did likewise. All clear, Wedge. A familiar voice called into his ear. You damaged? I'm fine, Luke, Wedge assured him. Thanks. Look, there it goes, Han's voice cut in. Over by the frigate. It's one of Lando's mole miners, all right. I see it, Luke said. What's it doing out here? I saw one stuck onto the Star Cruiser back there, Wedge told him, swinging back on course for the frigate. Looks like this one's trying to do the same thing. I don't know why. Whatever it's doing, let's stop it, Han said. Right. It was, Wedge saw, going to be a close race, but it was quickly clear that the mole miner was going to win it. Already it had turned its base around toward the frigate and was starting to nestle up against the hull. And just before it closed the gap completely, he caught a glimpse of an acridly brilliant light. What was that? Luke asked. I don't know, Wedge said, blinking away the after image. It looked too bright for laser fire. It was a plasma jet. Han grunted as the falcon came up alongside him, right on top of the bridge emergency escape hatch. That's what they wanted the mole miners for. They're using them to burn through the hulls. He broke off and abruptly he swore. Luke, we got it backwards. They're not here to wreck the fleet. They're here to steal it. For a long heartbeat, Luke just stared at the frigate. And then, like pieces clicking together in a puzzle, it all fell into place. The mole miners, the undermanned and underdefended capital ships that the New Republic had been forced to press into shipping service, the Imperial fleet out there that seemed to be making no real effort to push its way past the system's defences, and a New Republic star cruiser, mole miner planted firmly on its side, but had just fired on Wedge's X-Wing. It took a moment to scan the sky around him. Moving with deceptive slowness through the continuing starfighter battle, a number of warships were beginning to pull out. We've got to stop them, he told the others. Good thinking, Han agreed. How? Is there any way we can get aboard them ourselves, he asked. Lando said the mole miners were two-man ships. The Imperials can't possibly have packed more than four or five stormtroopers in each one of them. The way those warships are manned at the moment, four stormtroopers would be plenty, Wedge pointed out. Yes, but I could take them, Luke said. On all fifty ships, Han countered. Besides, you blast a hatch open to vacuum and you'll have pressure bulkheads closing all over the ship. Take you forever to even get to the bridge. Luke gritted his teeth, but Han was right. Then we have to disable them, he said. Knock out their engines or control systems or something. If they get to the perimeter and those star destroyers, we'll never see them again. Oh, we'll see them again, Han growled, pointed straight back at us. You're right. Disabling as many as we can is our best shot. We're never going to stop all 50, though. We don't have 50 to stop, at least not yet, Wedge put in. There are still 12 mole miners that haven't attached themselves to ships. Good. Let's take them out first, Han said. You got vectors on them? Feeding your computers now? Okay. Okay, here we go. The Falcon twisted its head round and heading off in a new direction. Luke, get on the comm and tell the Slewis control what's happening, he added. Tell them not to let any ships out of the orbit dock area. Right. Luke switched channels on the comm, and as he did so, he was suddenly aware of a slight change in sense from the Falcon's cockpit. Huh, you all right? Huh? Sure. Why? I don't know. You seem to change. I had half a grip on some idea, Han said, but it's gone now. Come on, make that call. I want you back on the quads when we get there. The call to Slewis control was over well before they reached their target mole miner. They thank us for the information, Luke reported to the others, but they say they don't have anything to spare at the moment to help us. Probably don't, Han agreed. Okay, I see two TIE fighters running escort. Wedge, you and Rogue Five take them out while Luke and I hit the mole miner. Got it, Wedge confirmed. The two X-wings shot past Luke's canopy, flaring apart into intercept mode as the TIE fighters broke formation and came around to meet the attack. Luke, try to blow it apart instead of disintegrating it, Han suggested. Let's see how many people the Imperials have got stuffed inside. Got it, Luke said. The mole miner was in his sights now. Adjusting his power level down, he fired. The truncated cone flared as the metal, dead center of the shot boiled away into glowing gas. The rest of the craft seemed intact, though, and Luke was just lining up for a second shot when the hatch of the two hop abruptly popped open. Through the opening, a monstrous robot-like figure came charging out. What? It's a space trooper, Han snapped back. A space trooper in zero-g armor. Hang on. He spun the falcon around away from the space trooper, but not before there was a flash from a protuberance atop the other's backpack and the hull around Luke slammed with a violent concussion. Han rolled the ship around, blocking Luke's view as another concussion rocked them. And then they were pulling away, pulling away but with agonizing slowness. Luke swallowed hard, wondering what kind of damage they'd taken. 
Han, Luke, you all right? Wedge's voice called anxiously. Yeah, for now, Han called back. You get the TIE Fighters? Yes. I think the mole mine is still underway, though. Well, then blast it, Han said. Nothing cute, just blow it apart. But watch out for that space trooper. He's using miniature proton torpedoes or something. I'm trying to draw him away. I don't know if he'll fall for it. He's not, Wedge said grimly. He's staying right on top of the mole miner. They're heading for a passenger liner. Looks like they'll make it, too. Han swore under his breath. Probably got a few regular stormtrooper buddies still in there. All right, I guess we do this the hard way. Hang on, Luke. We're going to ram him. Where what? Luke's last word was lost in the roar from the engines as Han sent the Falcon flying straight out and then around in a hard turn. The mole miner and space trooper came back into Luke's line of sight. Wedge had been wrong. The space trooper wasn't standing by the damaged mole miner. He was, in fact, sidling quickly away from it. The twin protuberances on top of his backpack began flashing again. A couple of seconds later, the Falcon's hull began ringing with proton torpedo blasts. Get ready, Han called. Luke braced himself, trying not to think about what would happen if one of those torpedoes hit his canopy, and trying to not to wonder if Han could really ram the space trooper without also plowing into the passenger liner directly behind him. Ignoring the proton blasts, the Falcon continued accelerating, and without warning, Han dropped the ship beneath the space trooper's line of fire. Wedge, go! From beneath Luke's line of sight, an action flashed upward, laser cannon blazing, and the mole miner shattered into flaming dust. Good shot. Han told him, a note of satisfaction in his voice as he veered underneath the liner, nearly taking the Falcon's main sensor dish off from the process. There you go, hotshot. Enjoy your view of the battle. Bladedly, the light dawned. He was listening in on our channel, Luke said. He just wanted to decoy him into moving away from the mole miner. You got it, Han said. I figured he'd tap in. Imperials always do when they can. He trailed off. What is it? Luke asked. I don't know, Han said slowly. There's something about this whole thing that keeps poking at me, but I can't figure out what it is. Never mind. Our hotshot space trooper will keep for now. Let's go hit some more mole miners. It was just as well, Palaon fought, for they were only here to keep the enemy tied up. The Sluisi and their New Republic allies were putting up one terrific fight. On his status board, a section of the Chimera's shield schematic went red. Get that starboard shield back up, he ordered, giving the sky in that direction a quick scan. There were half a dozen warships out there, all of them firing like mad, with a battle station in backstop position behind them. If their sensors showed that the Chimera's starboard shields were starting to go, starboard turbo lasers focus all fire on the assault frigate at 32 Mark 40. Fraun spoke up calmly, concentrate on the starboard side of the ship only. The Chimera guns responded with a withering hail of laser fire. The assault frigate tried to swerve away, but even as it turned, his entire starboard side seemed to flash with vaporized metal. The weapons from that section, which had been firing non-stop, went abruptly silent. Excellent, Fraun said. Starboard tractor crews, lock on and bring it in close. Try to keep it between the damaged shields and the enemy, and be sure to keep its starboard side facing toward us. The port side may still have active weapons and a crew to use them. Clearly against its will, the assault frigate began to move inward. Plan watched it for a moment, then returned his attention to the overall battle. He had no doubt the tractor crew would do the job right. They'd shown a remarkable increase in efficiency and competence lately. TIE Squadron 4, keep after that B-Wing group, he instructed. Port Ion Cannon, keep up the pressure on that command center. He looked at Fraun. Any specific orders, Admiral? Fraun shook his head. No, the battle seems to be progressing as planned. He turned his glowing eyes on Pleon. What word from Cloak Leader? Pleon checked the proper display. The TIE Fighters are still engaging the various escort ships, he reported. Forty-three of the mole miners have successfully attached to target ships. Of those, thirty-nine are secure and making for the perimeter. Four are still encountering internal resistance, for they anticipate a quick victory. And the other eight? They've been destroyed, Pleon told him, including two of those of a space trooper aboard. One of those space troopers is failing to respond to Com, presumably killed with his craft. The other is still functional. Cloak Leader has ordered him to join the attack on the escort ships. Countermand that. Fraun said, I'm quite aware that stormtroopers have infinite confidence in themselves, but that sort of deep space combat is not what space trooper suits were designed for. Have Cloak Leader to tail a TIE fighter to bring him out, and also inform him that his wing is to begin pulling back to the perimeter. Pelayam frowned. You mean now, sir? Certainly now, Fraun nodded toward the viewpoint. The first of our new ships will begin arriving within 15 minutes. As soon as they're all with us, the task force will be withdrawing. But the rebel forces within the perimeter are of no further concern to us, Captain. Fraun said with quiet satisfaction. The captured ships are on their way. If we're without TIE fighter cover, there's nothing the rebels can do to stop them. Han brought the Falcon as close as he could to the frigate's engines without risking a backwash, filling the slight multiple dips in ship's power as Luke repeatedly fired the quads. 
Anything? he asked as they came up around the other side. Doesn't look like it, Luke said. There's just too much armour over the cool and feeder lines. He hand glanced across along the frigate's course, fighting back the urge to swear. They were already uncomfortably close to the perimeter battle and getting closer all the time. This isn't getting us anywhere. It's got to be some way to take out a capital ship. That's what other capital ships are for, Wedge put in. But you're right, this isn't working. Han pursed his lips. R2, you still online back there? He called. The droid's beeping came faintly up the cockpit corridor. Go for your schematics again, Han ordered. See if you can find us another weak point. R2 beeped again in acknowledgement, but it wasn't a very optimistic beep. He's not going to find anything better, Han, Luke said, echoing Han's own private assessment. I don't think we've got any choice left. I'm going to have to go topside and use my lightsaber on it. That's crazy and you know it, Han growled. Without a proper pressure suit and with engine cool and spraying all over you if it works, how about using one of the droids, Wedge suggested. Neither of them can do it, Luke told him. R2 hasn't got the manipulative ability and I wouldn't trust 3 over a weapon, especially not with all the high acceleration maneuvers we're making. What we need is a remote manipulator arm, Han said. Something that Luke could use inside while he broke off. In a flash of inspiration, there it was, the thing that had been bothering him ever since they'd walked into this crazy battle. Lando, he called into the intercom. Lando, get up here. I got him strapped in, Luke reminded him. Well, go unstrap him and get him up here. Han snapped. Now, Luke didn't waste time with questions. Right, he said. What is it? Wedge asked tensely. Han clenched his teeth. We were there on Klon when the Imperials stole these mole miners from Lando, he told the other. We had to reroute our communications through some jamming. Okay, so? So why were they jamming us? Han asked. To keep us from calling for help? From who? They're not jamming us here, you notice. I give up, Wedge said, starting to sound a little testy. Why? Because they had to. Because, because most of the mole miners on the Klon are running on radio remote, came a tired voice from behind him. Han turned around to see Lando easing his way carefully into the cockpit, clearly riding at half speed, but just as clearly determined to make it. Luke was right behind him, a steadying hand on his elbow. You heard all that? Han asked him. Every part that mattered, Lando said, dropping into the co-pilot seat. I could kick myself for not seeing it long ago. Me too. You remember any of the command codes? Most of them, Lando said. What do you need? We don't have time for any, anything fancy. Han nodded toward the frigate, now lying below them. The mole miners are still attached to the ships. Just start them all running. Lando looked at him in surprise. Start them running? He echoed. You got it, Han confirmed. All of them are going to be near a bridge or control wing. They can burn through enough equipment and wiring it should knock out the whole lot of them. Lando exhaled noisily, tilting his head sideways in a familiar gesture of reluctant acceptance. You're the boss, he said, fingers moving over the comm keyboard. I just hope you know what you're doing. Ready? Han braced himself. Do it. Lando keyed a final section of code, and beneath them, the frigate twitched. Not a brig twitch, not at first, but as the seconds passed, it became increasingly clear that something down there was wrong. The main engines flickered a few times and then died, amid short bursts from the auxiliaries. Its drive toward the primitive fighting faltered, its etheric control surfaces kicking in and then out again, striving to change course in random directions. The big ship floundered almost to a halt, and suddenly the side of the hull directly opposite the mole miner's position erupted in a brilliant burst of flame. It's cut all the way through, Lando gasped, his tone not sure whether to be proud or dismayed by his handiwork. A TIE fighter, perhaps answering a distress call from the stormtroopers inside, swept directly into the stream of superheated plasma before it could maneuver away. It emerged from the other side, its solar panels blazing a fire, and exploded. It's working, Wedge called, sounded awed. Look, it's working. Han looked up from the frigate. All around them, all throughout the orbit dock area, ships that had been marking, making for deep space were suddenly twisting around like metallic animals in the throes of death, all of them with tongues of flame shooting through their sides. For a long minute, Thrawn sat in silence, staring down at his status boards, apparently oblivious to the battle still raging on all around them. Pleon held his breath, waiting for the inevitable explosion of injured pride at the unexpected reversal, wondering what form that explosion would take. Abruptly, the Grand Admiral raised his eyes to the viewport. Have all the remaining Cloak Force TIE fighters returned to our ships, Captain? He asked calmly. Yes, sir, Pleon told him, still waiting. Thrawn nodded. In order of a task force to begin its withdrawal. Uh, withdrawal? Pleon asked cautiously. It was not exactly the order he'd been anticipating. Thrawn looked at him, a faint smile on his face. You were expecting perhaps that I'd order an all-out attack? He asked. But I would seek to cover our defeat in a frenzy of false and futile heroics? Of course not, Pleon protested. But he knew down deep, but the other knew the truth. Thrawn's smile remained, but was suddenly cold. We haven't been defeated, Captain, he said quietly. Merely slowed down a bit. 
We have Wayland, and we have the treasures of the Emperor's storehouse. Sluisvan was to be merely a preliminary to the campaign, not the campaign itself. As long as we have Mount Tantus, our ultimate victory is still assured. He looked out the viewport, a thoughtful expression on his face. We've lost this particular prize, Captain, but that's all we've lost. I will not waste ships and men trying to change that which cannot be changed. There will be many more opportunities to obtain the ships we need. Carry out your orders. Yes, Admiral, Pleon said, turning back to his status board, a surge of relief washing through him, so there would not be an explosion after all. And with a twinge of guilt, he realised that he should have known better from the start. Thrawn was not merely a soldier, like so many others Pleon had served with. He was, instead, a true warrior, with his eyes set on the final goal and not on his own personal glory. Taking one last look out the viewport, Pleon issued the order to retreat, and wondered, once again, what the Battle of Endor would have been like if Thrawn had been in command. It took a while longer after the Imperial fleet pulled out of for the battle to be officially over. But with the Star Destroyers gone, the outcome was never in doubt. The regular stormtroopers were the easiest. Most of them were dead already. Killed when Lando's activation of the mole miners had ruptured the air seals of their stolen ships, left them open to vacuum, and the rest were taken without much trouble. The eight remaining space troopers, whose zero-g suits had allowed them to keep fighting after their ships were disabled, were another story entirely. Ignoring all calls to surrender, they fanned out through the shipyards, clearly intent on causing as much damage as they could before the inevitable. Six were hunted down and destroyed, the other two eventually self-destructed, one managing to cripple a corvette in the process. He left behind him a shipyard, an orbit dock facility, and an uproar, and a great number of severely damaged major ships. Not exactly what you'd call a resounding victory, Captain Affion grunted, surveying what was left of the Larkus's bridge for a pressure bulkhead, viewport as he gingerly adjusted a battle dressing that had been applied to his forehead. Going to take a couple months' work just to rewire all the control circuits. Would you rather the Imperials had gotten it whole? Han demanded from behind him, trying to ignore his own mixed feelings about this whole thing. Yes, it had worked, but at what cost? Not at all, Afrin replied calmly. You did what you had to. And I'd say that even if my own neck hadn't been on the line. I'm just saying what others will say, for destroying all these ships in order to save them was not exactly the optimal solution. Han threw a look at Luke. You sound like Counselor Failure. He accused Afyon. The other nodded. Exactly. Well, fortunately, failure is only one voice, Luke offered. Yeah, but it's a loud one, Han said sourly. And one that a lot of people are starting to listen to, Wedge added, including important military people. He'll find some way to parlay this incident into his own political gain, Afyon rumbled. You just watch him. Han's rejoinder was interrupted by a trilling from the wall intercom. Afyon stepped over and tapped the switch. Afyon here, he said. Sluis Control Communications, a voice replied. We have an incoming call from Coruscant for Captain Solo. Is he with you? Right here, Han called, stepping over to the speaker. Go ahead. There was a slight pause, and then a familiar and sorely missed voice came on. Han? It's Leia. Leia, Han said, feeling a delighted and probably slightly foolish-looking grin spread across his face. A second later, though, wait a minute. What are you doing back on Coruscant? I think I've taken care of our other problem, she said. Her voice, he noticed for the first time, sounded tense and more than a little ragged, at least for the moment. Han threw a frown across the room at Luke. You think? Look, that's not important right now, she insisted. What's important is that you get back here right away. Something cold and hard settled into Han's stomach. For Leia to be this upset, what's wrong? He heard her take a deep breath. Admiral Akbar has been arrested and removed from command, on charges of treason. The room abruptly filled with a brittle silence. Han looked in turn at Luke, at Afyon, at Wedge, but there didn't seem to be anything to say. I'll be there as soon as I can, he told Leia. Luke's here too. You want me to bring him? Yes, if he can manage it, she said. Akbar's going to need all the friends he can get. Okay, Han said. Call me in the Falcon if there's any more news. We're heading over there right now. I'll see you soon. I love you, Han. Me too. He broke the connection, turned back to the others. Well, he said to no one in particular, there goes the hammer. You coming, Luke? Luke looked at Wedge. Have your people had a chance to do anything with my X-Wing yet? Not yet, Wedge said, shaking his head. But it's just been officially bumped to the top of the priority list. We'll have it ready to fly in two hours, even after taking the motivators out of my own ship to do it. Luke nodded and looked back at Han. I'm flying to Coruscant on my own then, he said. Let me just come with you and get R2 off the Falcon. Right, come on. Good luck, Afyon called softly after them. And yes, Han fought as they hurried down the corridor toward the hatchway where the Falcon was docked. The hammer was indeed coming down. 
If failure and his faction push too hard and too fast, and knowing failure, he would almost certainly push too hard and too fast. We could be on the edge of a civil war here, Luke murmured, his fought back at him. Yeah, well, we're not going to let that happen, Han told him with confidence he didn't feel. We haven't gone through a war and back just to watch some overambitious boffin wreck it. How are we going to stop him? Han grimaced. We'll think of something.